manage Rob Moores. I live in Leeds in West Yorkshire in England. And along with my other half, who's also called Sarah, I like, I know your other half, Sarah as well, I believe. But we have a, a one acre market garden site. We're towards the close of our third season now. I'd still say we're in startup. We inherited a, basically a hay field, a heavy clay hay field full of thistle and perennial weeds. And we've had to go in there and it's pretty well hand dug out. I think like a lot of small market gardeners with minimal mechanization, pretty chemical free, artificial fertilizer free, peat free, et cetera, um, without being specified organic, don't particularly want to go down that route. But what do we grow? We grow traditional market garden. So we have some small polytunnels in which we grow through on the seasoned shoulders, lettuces uh, and leaves, the rocket, beans, dwarf beans. And then in the summer, we mostly focus on cucumbers and uh, various tomatoes. And then outside, yep, anything from brassicas, potatoes, Sweets, juice of artichokes, fruit bushes, rhubarb, onions, garlic, the normal kind of stuff. But we also, a little, maybe a little bit differently, we also have a range of plants as well. So we grow edible food and we grow horticultural plants. So I wouldn't say we have a, a nursery, but though I suppose probably about 20% of our sales comes through annual bedding plants and perennial plants. So we like that mix. We're also starting to add, create value added products to add to our range on the basis that nobody ever got rich growing potatoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So three years in, it's interesting. You say you're still in the startup phase. What puts you still in startup three years into the journey? I think knowledge. We've both run businesses before. So the business of business more than happy with the back end of business and the mechanics of running a business. But in terms of I'm a grower by nature, Sarah has always been at least a keen horticulturalist. We had a, an allotment for five years before we took on the market garden yeah, deliberately to learn how to grow consistently. It's very different growing for yourself than trying to grow commercially, as, as you all know, Alec, completely different. If something fails on your allotment or in your own garden, you just get it in the supermarket and buy it. You don't have that luxury when you've got to, got to supply customers. So that, but again, that consistency and the quality is, it's a completely different animal from just growing for yourself. And I think in terms of kind of soil ecology, the whole growing cycle, management of the land, management of the polytunnel, you call them hoop houses, we call them polytunnels. I think that's the same thing. That's very different and in some ways it does extend your season and make things easier, but it has its own challenges. We could be up to 50 degrees centigrade in, in the day or five degrees centigrade in the night, and that puts a lot of stress on plants. Plus, you still get plenty of disease and bugs in polytunnels as well as outside. So we think we're still very much in the startup stage, both in terms of that side of the production side of the business, but also learning who our customers are and how to best interact with them. Certainly on, in terms of marketing, social media, promo, et cetera, <laughs> almost pre-startup still in terms of a bit capabilities, I think. What's something you've heard so far in the series with Alec where either in a positive way, uh, meaning a high of his season or a low of his season, where you heard that and you're like, oh, I'm right there with you. I feel that. The highs, I love you. Love talking when you talk about the broccolini. I still don't know what it is. I still got to Google it. So I, I heard someone else mention it the other day. I don't think that's something, unless we call it something slightly different uh, here. I, it's, I, I, it's just the side shoots of the broccoli. Okay. So we might call it tender stem. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, we, partic yeah. We, we particularly grow variety that puts out a really small loose head and then sends out a ton of side shoots. Tender oh, stem. Good. You're right. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll check that one out afterwards. So that's been really interesting to hear about your passion for that and, and, and carrots and the things that you do that are going really well. And then more recently you talked about sales tailing off, either tailing off or not rising as you'd expect and as you need to get to that kind of what you consider to be your break-even point. Both of those speak to our own story really clearly. As I say, it's said earlier, it's great to hear we're not the only ones in it, but, but that doesn't mean we want you to be in that situation just because we are. Yeah. We just said, I suppose we'd rather be the only ones in it, but, but it's nice to know you're not alone. And they are, they are problems that everybody, every business faces, every small business owner faces when you're short of maybe, you're short of capital, you're short of time. That's one thing I'm glad you brought up because 
I've been thinking about this a lot. Everything we talk about, I think, is a real representation of what starting a farm is like because we're telling it how it is. But it's one story. And that by limiting down the population set to one story, it's real, but it's only one person's story. How, based on your story, so now we'll expand the population set to two, the stuff you hear Alec going through for anybody new wanting to get into farming how close are we to how it actually is based on your experience? Do you feel this is a pretty fair representation that catches more or less like what this experience is actually like? Yeah, I think it is for the entrepreneur, farmer slash market gardener. I think there's uh, where we are based, there's a lot of more community or charity based market gardens. And I think that's a whole, that's a whole different ball game and a whole different mindset. And, and I guess that's something that possibly doesn't come through. My background is running small businesses. And so the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial mindset and attitude, do or die attitude speaks to both of us. You can really chimes with us. So yeah, we we'll get a lot out of that. What's been the biggest takeaway from some of your other businesses that just speak to that entrepreneurial mindset, things that from farming things you've done in the past that, hey, if you're going to get into this, has been my experience from an entrepreneur, think about these things, do these things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I spend a lot of time when I'm reading, thinking about the bit about what business is about. And there's a dy I think there's a dichotomy, isn't there? That on the one hand, you've got your vision and your plan and your strategies and all that kind of framing your business. And on the other hand, you've got to go and do stuff. Like you said, you go do the work. You've got to get out there, dig holes in the ground, put something in, water it, dig it up, take it to market, sell it, collect the cash, bank the cash, account for it, et cetera, and, and go round and round again. And I think getting the balance right is important. I've seen businesses where people spend years planning, creating visions, missions, strategies for the business, but never actually get out and do anything. And if you're not doing anything, you're not learning. Whereas for me, I'm, well, I don't know if, if it's a correct description of action learning, but for me, I learn. I think it's important to have that frame. I want to know I'm playing in on this field and not on this field. But once I've decided what field I'm in, then you've got to get, you learn by doing. I was very tempted before starting this business to go and do a, a master's to learn about how to do things as per the textbook, put off by the fees. Even though I'm on a slightly different topic, I do still work full time at a university. Sarah works full time in the business, but 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 having totted it all up and taken thinking of the cost and taking a year out of my life, I thought I'd learn more by going and renting a field, digging a hole in the ground, and putting some seeds in and see what comes up. I think that's the best way to learn. But you've got to you've got to understand the context in which you're doing that. So I think working from both ends, that kind of the framing end and the action end gives you the best chance of success. You, you can't just go around digging holes in the ground and not know why you're digging the holes in the ground and what your eventual aim is. So you've got to have that plan, but you've got to go and, as you say, do the work because that's the best way to learn. You can read all the books you want, but until you've really tried to grow uh, a 25 meter bed of cabbages, you have no idea what they, what's going to happen because you don't know. The book doesn't know what land you're on. Doesn't know it doesn't know the soil, doesn't know the the, the atmosphere, the con the, the contact, doesn't know your customers. So the best way to learn is this to get up and actually do it. 100%. Yeah, I'm curious to know what sort of yep. what sort of preparatory work did you do other than getting out and doing the work, which I know is extremely important for all of us. Are you a book guy? Are you like voraciously consuming YouTube content, podcasts? Were you doing courses? What were some of the early preparations and kind of knowledge gaining practices that you did to prepare to get to the inevitable place where you can get on the land and start yeah. actually doing that work? Well, I guess we've run some businesses in the past, kind of more medium sized businesses than small, just us and a couple of people businesses. So we've got that kind of business background, which helps all the back end, the kind of the legalities, the accounts, all that kind of stuff. So. That, that work was done and put to bed. We could, we know, we can do that quite easily. Prior to this business, we did run what we call a community interest company. There's a number that is a reference to a, a, comp a company type in the USA that I believe is very similar for a community organization. 
can't remember what it's called. And we ran that and that was a company that focused on improving mental health by giving people opportunities to get involved in growing. And we ended up running an indoor vertical farm, growing microgreens hydroponically and a shipping container. So again, we had some experience growing in a controlled okay. environment. We had customers who were used to that, producing to order, producing quality. Again, the, the timing of the logistics, getting the cash collection, setting the pricing, doing the marketing, bit on the branding. They're still out there. Uh, their branding is probably still one of our weak points. So we had all that kind of experience, not explicitly learning for this business, but it was there in the background. For this business, yeah, we, we, we took an allotment, so a, a, a small kind of parcel of land in, in a local allotment and started laying, having read, yeah, did start watching some of the YouTube, to stone, Jean Paul Fournier, Jean Martin Fournier. Yeah. Um, you can edit that bit out there. Go, I go, if I get his name wrong, or I'll, I'll, I'll insult the guy. Bought his book and uh, started doing the, the, the kind of 30 inch beds. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, and really took on board that element about standardizing everything. So although we were just on a small allotment, no many beds, we made sure they were all exactly the same length, the right width. We did 30 inches work. It works for my inside leg measurement, but not necessarily for Sarah's. And that actually, we, we were moving away from those, I think, in the longer term. But anyway, all that, all the hoops, the netting, just making sure all that was right and try to come up with a production plan. So we're just experimenting with what would grow, especially on the shoulders of seasons, not in the main seasons, but early on and late on and over winter. Made sure we were peat free, not using any artificial fertilizers, only using organic fertilizers, not, not using any pesticides. Because yeah, ever we, until we've got some cans of bowls of stuff in, in, in the shed where you've made sure we weren't using those anymore and just assessing the impact on those. So we had three years, I think, doing that, but not and, because and we wanted were you, it. You were selling, like you were in production during those three years? Yeah. We just did a, a veg box just for family members and neighbors. Okay. Yeah. Just to test the market out. And again, just learn. You can read a book, you can watch a YouTube video on someone doing a veg box scheme, but until you do it yourself. You exactly. Don't see all the things, little things that are going to trip you up. And there's always over things those, that trip you up. Over those three years, how many people were getting boxes at a time? Oh, uh, only, only a maximum of four to six. Yeah. yeah. And only, only at certain times of the year. Maybe that'd only be like for six weeks for a set of people and kind of four weeks for another set of people. So it was dipping in and out. We were growing very small amounts, but just getting into that discipline of pick, pack, dispatch collect the money, et cetera, uh, produce the receipts, just making sure that we, all that was ticking over and it just became second nature to us. We wouldn't have taken three years to do it. It took us two years to find a piece of land. The idea was just to do that for one season, but we couldn't get it. Having said that, we did have a couple of commercial customers going back to the growing better days. We've always grown microgreens and pea shoots and we do, we've always provided a particular local grocers and a couple of other shops at various points as well. So we've always had that to some, as well as family and friends, we've always had a little bit of commercial business as well, which again, is just useful experience and learn to how to build relationships with other business people. Really Where important. would you say you're at now in your journey? If you looked at when this thing's fully up and running, it's the trains moving down the tracks, it provides all the income you need it to provide. You, you've learned the first 80% of what you need to go. You're a business. Where are you in relation to that? Are you close? Are you still years away? Where would you put yourself? I'd say another two seasons. Uh, I, and as I said that, when you, when I did watch the YouTube videos and did a bit of reading to start with, people say three to five years, you say, nah, they've been 12 months, 18 months. Easy. I've, I've run a business before. I, I, we've run a, we're growing in the allotment. This will be easy. But it's every situation. Every business situation is so individual that there's always that much to learn. But yeah, I think three, th this three years is a, in it, one year was an important marker. Three years is an important marker and five years will be an important marker as well. I think one and three, are, do we keep going? And five is because we've got the potential to make it. And at five years, you're looking back and saying, if I haven't made it, then I've really got to learn some big lessons quickly for my sixth year because I can't go on. Not making it forever becomes a point when you have to say enough is enough and it's not going to work for us in this particular situation. 
I think that's really wise, that one, three, five plan. It mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense to me. What, what is your thought, Alec, of thinking of that? Here you are, you're grinding through year one. When you think three to five years to make it and you hear what Rob laid out, three years of like, all right, we made it to one, we made it to three. If I don't figure it out by five, you're probably moving on or doing some adjusting. What do you think? Yeah, I, I like that. I think it's, yeah, I think taking it every single year is probably a little bit too, can be a little too micro. Like at some point you have to start looking at like the macro kind of trends of things. Like I think about it with my kids when they're young, every little milestone is a big deal when it's like weeks to months. And then you reach a point in which it's like, all right, now we're not going to measure them in months anymore. We're going to measure them in years for most people. <laughs> and then suddenly those milestones become bigger but they become further spread apart. And yeah, no, I, and, it, and right now my head is so focused in on let's just survive year one. Uh, yeah. Not even just from a sense of that's like a finish line and then we can take a break. It's more just so we can know what a full season will look like to know what to expect next winter versus this coming winter that we're prepping for now. I mean, no, I like that. I like the idea of having milestones that become bigger yet more spread out as time goes along. and because of those earlier milestones that sort of begin to pile up quickly, it gives you the confidence of knowing, all right, we can make it two years until we get to that year three point and go, okay, let's reevaluate, let's reassess, and then let's go another two more and then really determine, is this worth it? Is this something that we want to do for 10 and so on and so forth. So no, I definitely resonate with, with that from the, uh, like this side of it, it definitely seems like a good mindset and a good thing to, to remember of not taking yeah. too much stock of kind of our progress and being able to step back and trust that longer journey. Yeah. I pick up on a couple of points you said there. One, survival. Uh, yeah. I'm physically able to do it. Uh, after a full season, can I physically do this? Not everybody can. And mentally, can I do this? And my family and friends, relationships, can they survive this as well? It puts an awful strain in any business, but especially something as physical as, as what we do. Just, put, it just puts a strain on all parts of your being and, and your world. And also you made the great point about having gone through the, the first full cycle and the first season. So you see, you've seen everything once at a minimum. So yeah, if, if you've done it for one year, you can do it for three. If you can keep, if you've got that mentality and physically able to do it for one year, you can get to year three if you've done one year, but you can. Then it's more, can I survive? And, and I, what, at three years, have I got, have I built the germ of a, the seed of a, a long-term sustainable yeah. business? You probably in three years, year one, you're hacking, everything's a hack. You're just banging nails into bits of wood to hold things up. And, but year three, you, you've built, maybe you've got some half decent irrigation in, you've got some high coop houses up, whatever. Then three to five, hopefully for us, that's where we want to be at the end of it. This is maybe just describing our journey, not telling you yours. But at five, hopefully we've got the infrastructure in the land now. That's done. That hard work, that groundwork is done. We've invested in the land. We've built the soil health up. Now we should be able to reap the raw zone. And if it, so if we get to five and we've done that, then we should be able to scale up a lot more exponentially because you've done all that groundwork. And we're using all these metaphors like <laughs> years and groundwork, and they, re- they apply so Literally, much to yeah. the, the business we're in, yeah. How much, looking back at the end of year one and then now, you know, coming toward the end of year three, how much has the business evolved? If we would have talked to Rob first year and very beginning, get your feet in the dirt for the very first time and say, what is this going to look like? And then a year from then, and then now three years from then, how much has changed from your initial plan and, and how much has evolved and become refined over that time? Or... I think the biggest change is confidence. Every, when you start a business, I always say a business is it's a hypothesis, isn't it? When you start a business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you test the hypothesis and we've tested it and it's holding up. Okay. It's creaked a bit on a, you know, a few bits we've had to rebuild, and, but generally that hypothesis has held up. So therefore that gives us a lot of confidence. And we did our first, we, we, I say we're coming to the end of our third season. We, we signed our lease in, a, in September 20, we got a, a, what we call it, a, a three year, three year, if we talk about that for a very short period of time, three year business farm tenancy. So we got, on the, we got signed that in September 21, but it was an awful winter and our land is very heavy clay. 
you literally couldn't walk on it without going over on your backside. It was just like a skating rink. It's like clay is just so slippery when it gets wet. Like you couldn't dig anything up. You put your fork in the ground. You couldn't pull the fork out. So if you did, it, it was like a big ball of mud and thistles on the end. So we really didn't get to do too much on the land till the March. But by the July, we were doing our first farmer's market. So again, we just decided we're just going to dive in and try and do everything possible we can. Because it, it, it was a short year and a short season. And we did make some mistakes, but we wanted to experiment and get as much as, as much of what we thought we wanted done in that first year as possible ex to experience it. So just going back to your question. So confidence, I think, is, is the biggest thing now. We know we can do it. We've, I think we had one polytunnel up at the end of that, that first summer. We got uh, three and three quarters up now. Just got to skin the fourth and then a fifth one to go up. Hopefully before the end of the season, it's starting to get a little bit gusty now. So it's hard to pull it up when it's, uh, when it's so windy. But if we have enough people, we'll get to five. I also think the, di the diversification into plants has been really good for us. Really good for us. We're really pleased to have done that. Flush that out. What do you mean by diversification of plants? But initially, we were just, we were just, just trying to grow cabbages, brussels, potatoes. Cucumbers, tomatoes, squashes, and Eric is, is more of a horticulturist than a grow than a food grower um, by background. And we thought that we could grow some produce, some ornamental perennial plants, flowers, shrubs to take to market. Great thing about those is if you don't sell them, you'd have to you'd have to eat them yourself or give them away or bin them. You just bring them back next month and they're a bit bigger. So you charge even more for them. Yeah. So it's, you know, you've still got to take them, but kind of being a little, simplifying a little bit, but generally it's been, uh, it's been good. It also brings people to our market store and then they buy the fruit and veg as well. But if we probably 20% of our business overall, maybe less, maybe 15, but up to 30% of uh, the farmer's market is plants, actual plants. We buy plug plants and grow them on. We take strawberry runners. We do divisions and cuttings and grow from seeds, a whole mixture. I think that's something else we would le we've learned as well, which we've probably taken more from more livestock farming. I think when I was younger, I had this naive view that a livestock farmer would get two pigs together. They'd create baby pigs. The, the farm would grow the pigs on till they were age for slaughtering and slaughter them. And the whole cycle would go again. But in livestock farming, there's people that breed pigs, there's people that wean pigs, there's people that grow them on, et cetera, et cetera. And they're passed through. And so the same with plants and even some edible plants, we don't have, to, we don't feel we have to grow everything from seed. So again, we have a bit of a mix and it minute that reduces our risk. So I think we try and take a risk view as much as we can. So I think we've got better and smarter at how we manage risk by having a bit of a diversification of product, but also where we, how we source it and how we grow it. So we'll grow some stuff from seed, but we'll grow some stuff on. So we buy strawberry bare roots plants, but we also take lots of runners, just as many runners as we buy in and, and, and grow new plants, either to plant on ourselves or to sell the farmer's market and through other channels. So that diversification to the point where it reduces risk and doesn't become a distraction. Yeah. Listen to a couple of your recent podcasts, Diego, about about getting easily getting distracted. The next shiny new thing, got a very cognizant of that from past business ventures. And but there is a fine line there um, between diversification to protect your business and diversification that just becomes a distraction from your business. Hundred percent. When you look at your playing or playing off your business is a hypothesis concept initially you had this hypothesis in the beginning what was the goal was it a full-time income for sarah was it a full-time income for both of you was this a fun exploration i think we can make this into something and along the way it turned into a business are you eventually trying to go full-time on the farm what's that part of the story yeah i think our ambition is that sarah would take a what we call the uk living wage which is above the minimum of a wage, but it's a, it's a sum. And, and she can take that as, a, as whatever hours, 20 to 40 hours, so up, up to a full-time salary, that would be it. And, and I won't. It's not, I don't think it's possible for it to fund two salaries, but it should be possible somewhere between three or five years. We've toyed this year, the past few months, with starting to pay her 
uh, a very basic salary, but we've decided to hold off. Let's wait till next season. So I guess it was always going to be years four and five that we started paying, that she started taking an income from the business. We're cash positive now, but we've invested a lot in it. So we would like to pay back that capital to ourselves as opposed to the business and then, and then start drawing a salary. So yeah, it's always been, it's always been the ambition that she would draw a salary. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? You needing to pay yourself out of a business in the beginning, keeping money in the business to fund future growth, maybe using money from the business to pay back a, a personal loan I borrowed from my savings to start the business. On one hand, you're working and it, and sometimes it can be demoralizing to work and not get paid. Even though I'm paying myself back, it's not, oh yeah, I could actually took in a check. So you can feel like you're doing nothing. And like many plants or horticulturists might encourage a plant, pinch off those initial flowers, let the roots go strong. Don't pull money out of the business at the beginning. Let it grow big, let it fruit later. What are your thoughts and just personal experience on this whole process of how you've pulled money out and navigating that, the emotional side, the financial side of it? Yeah. This is where my, my context is very different from Alex. I, like you, I, I still work full-time a day job. So that, that brings us enough money. And you work for organic? Yeah, I work on an organic farm part-time. Okay, that's right. Yeah. 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 And you're clearly you're trying to cut, cut that down and move into run the business full-time over, over a period. And it feels like you're doing a fantastic job. I'm not going to do that. And we don't have, I'm, I'm a lot older than you. So we're more, we have more kind of financial stability. We have our house paid off. So we just need to live day to day. I'm only a couple of years off drawing a state pension. I, financial concerns aren't so much for me. And I, I know that's a real, I appreciate that's a real privilege and a luxury, but you'll have it one day, Alec. you'll have it one day. Just as I didn't have it when I was your age, you will have it when I'm my age, hopefully. But it, it, it does mean that we don't have to worry financially about have I made that much this month mm. now that's the double-edged sword isn't it because I and I know that's I, I get the impression that that's a key driver for you you've got to bring in that 700 a week I think is the figure you said and it's, at some point if you don't you up the creek without a paddle that that's real money to you isn't it but that that, that keeps you sharp in a way that we can get we can afford to get a bit lazy and I'm, I'm very cognizant of that and I don't want to be like that. So that's why we try and really keep the business money in the business and, and, and see it as its own entity. And that way that could be just a success as a success independent of what our own financial means are. But in terms of my own involvement, then for my mental and physical health, I would pay to do it. I love, I, I kind of, I love finishing work and I get two or three hours up the field before it gets dark and straight up there, even just reading, I don't care, building a hoop house building compost bays, cutting grass. I don't care. I just love being up there in, in the open, doing some kind of manual work. I just find that really mindful and relaxing and good. Obviously it's really good um, as well. And cognizant of not going to hopefully go on about it too much, but at my age, I really have to take care of myself physically as well. So to be out doing some good exercise a, a lot is, is great as well. Plus we're just passionate about it. We love, we're really invested in what we're trying to achieve both in terms of build, building a successful business, but what we're trying to achieve in terms of evangelizing in our local community about good food choices, about being critical about food and global food systems, being critical about the use of chemicals and pesticides in food, critical as in being able to critique it and have people been able to take a, an informed view on these things, whatever they decide to. So yeah, I hope that answers your, your point there, Diego, in a very long-winded way. But yeah, involved in it very passionately from lots of angles, which makes it very fulfilling all around. Yeah, I'm, I'm but, curious how you mentioned previously that you've made choices to diversify or to eliminate risk, so on and so forth, like with purchasing transplants, as opposed to starting most of the things from seed on your own, marrying that with in reinvesting everything back into the farm and not taking that. How much of how much of, do you think those lessons that you learned are as a result of choosing to reinvest everything back into the farm and not take that? And if in a hypothetical world, if you were to put yourself, let's say in my shoes where I needed to make me money yeah. now to live, how much of those things do you think are like 
nope, these are good universal principles across the board, or these are just a product of the benefit that you have of the life that you've built for yourself? That's a really, that's a really great question. I like really great question. I, I think the answer tonight at least is to invest in your business as much as you can, but that's easy to say from where I'm sitting and I know that and for a lot of people, they have to take that money out of the business because they have to put a roof over their head and their family's head and they have to feed them. And that's not negotiable. That's more important than the business. To have a successful business and their family is not a good, it's, it is, is a lot worse than having a successful family and no business. I think I'd put, with hindsight, I'd always put uh, the family first. But, yeah. but that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that you can give up alcohol, you give up smoking, you can give up a lot of things and, and eke some extra money to put back in the business. But a lot of business, a lot of business it, it, money is good for business, but using the time and the money and the relationships you can build in the business as wisely as possible and eking those out is probably an even better discipline because when you've got money, it's easy to throw money at it. I mean, we'd, we're from, I'm, I'm, I live in Yorkshire and we are known as the most tight-fisted people in the UK. So we don't like to spend money unnecessarily and, and we don't. We're very, we're very thrifty. I uh, still drive around in like a 16-year-old car uh, that's kind of fall into bit, literally fall into bitch. Um, but that's fine. I'd rather do that and have another polytunnel or invest in some irrigation. I don't need those trappings. So it's how you spend your money, but very interested in kind of the lean startup type of approach. She's just start doing something very small, learning from it, reinvesting that learning, that product, whatever you've built and created and throwing it back in and building it again, which I'm absolutely sure you're doing. What would you do if you were in Alex's shoes right now? Imagine roles are reversed. You're his age. You don't have the university job. Family. Oh, I feel, I feel as I know this, but I hope you can see this. So I'd probably get a haircut first thing, Alec. I think, yeah. Never. Man, I, I want to hair. No, 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 no. Like, I, I dream of hair like that. Oh, yeah. 20 no, years no, yeah. being bald. It's like, and give me something I'm not to far behind you. I'm not far behind you, Diego. Yeah, I was just saying it's purely out of envy. What would I do? I don't think there's a like and I can teach how I or advise you on, I think you're doing what you're doing and the, the, the approach you've got or the mentality seems pretty textbook to me. I'm not sure that I would do anything else, but just keep doing what you're doing. Take them, know what you need to live on mm-hmm. and that's not, and then make that non-negotiable. And if you have to do extra, you have to go stack shells at a supermarket to bring that in, then whatever you have to do, but then use your time as wi- and resources as wisely as possible in your business. And I think, think about that. You say this so often, Diego, and I think I was listening to one of your, your carrot cash flow podcasts earlier tonight, and you talked about doing a thing that's the highest priority. And that's the lean, that's the lean approach, isn't it? What is the most important slash urgent thing I need to do today? What is the thing that I can't, that can't wait? And make sure you're always focused on the highest priority. What's the thing I can do that's going to be the biggest bang for my buck in the shortest possible time frame? Just having clarity on that makes the job more satisfying. And in some senses, it makes it easier because you don't have the burden of shall I do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You've got to do A today and you just go and do it. And when you've done it, you've got a satisfaction of knowing you've completed something or got in a good way into something well as you can you've made the most of your mental and physical being during this period to achieve the most you can possibly do and who can want more than that and who can ask more than that than anybody yeah i think there's some wisdom in in the way that you built your business that those of us who are bootstrapping it and really needing it to generate income right out of the back can learn what are the things that that really are worth the investment. Like you said, what are, what's the highest priority? What's the biggest bang for your buck? When you've mentioned three things that are very much in, in the front of my mind, which is high tunnels, irrigation, and then you transitioning to buying in your transplants. We we're on, we have one 50 foot tunnel. We can, I can do three market garden beds inside of there. We have, everything's on drip. 
mostly just because I just happened to be collecting stuff over the years and I've just rigged it together to work. And I found a farm very close by that I've recently discovered actually does a certified organic farm that does sell transplants to farmers. And I don't have the capital to totally redo any of those particular three, like or to do all three. But I could make a decision to say, all right, this year we're going to do one of them. And it's just curious from your perspective of being able to invest your money and kind of see which, which are the, be the biggest bang for your bucks. What are some of those things for an up and coming farmer who might be strapped for cash? What is going to be your, the biggest bang for your buck as far as reinvesting into the farm? I would say in terms of capital infrastructure, then polythermal hoop houses. I think the more you can move towards the controlled environment, better, the more consistent produce will come out of it. And I, I, and, and I really learned this. I worked a lot in, in my day job as a business analyst and worked a lot on business processes. And it's like garbage in, garbage out, good stuff in, good process, good stuff out. Working, building a, a vertical farm, indoor vertical farm business again, but you're in a controlled environment. Doesn't mean you can't get fruit flies and molds. And stuff can go wrong, but if you get the process right in the environment, what you put in, you, you have inputs, you have a controlled process, you will get defined outputs. So it's, the more you can move towards a controlled environment, you'll, the long-term consistency of your outputs will, Im, will improve. Plus it means you can grow for longer seasons, which has got to be a good thing. And you've got, you get more produce over time. So if, if that would, that would be number one and the two. You may be very lucky with just being, it would be investing in your soil, in the health of your soil. Yeah. Just getting as much organic matter. We keep it really simple. We, we know, we, honestly, we don't even do pH tests on the soil. We just try and get organic matter into it. There's lots of, it's heavy clay. There's lots of worms in it, which is fantastic. We think if there's lots of worms in it, that's good enough for stuff to grow in. We could go, we could start doing all sorts of fancy soil tests and stuff, but we're spending a lot of money and a lot of time for something that wasn't going to, was going to deliver marginal benefit. When we've grown a good crop, we want to get that last 5%. Maybe that's our feeling at the moment is that would be the time to do that kind of stuff. So yeah, hoop houses and, and soil. Interestingly, we haven't invested heavily in irrigation. If we didn't have mains water for the first year, we had to bring jerry cans of water up from home in the back of the Prius, which was a real ball ache. And Sarah early in the season, broken her arm and was out of action for three months. Yeah. yeah. So we did get mains water, so we got a pipe from there, but we've just event eventually decided to take it to a, a stand pipe and run a hose pipe, like domestic, long domestic hose pipes off that with a, a lance at the end, because it would take me several weeks to do the irrigation. I just haven't got low enough down on the list of jobs I have to do today. It's something I really want to do. It's important, but it's not urgent and it's got to be important and urgent for me to do it because we just don't have enough time. And the, the benefit is that because I trail the hose pipe through the polytunnels and, and the outdoor beds, I look at, we look at the plants every day mm. and that, so we know, uh, and, and that's, that's a bit of that, some of the cost of the time that it takes to do that. Yeah. No, I definitely agree. I think even just in the, the almost a year since we've been on this property. Uh, yeah. Cause we also signed a three year lease in September on our property. So very ah. much in, in the same boat in a lot of ways. But I would say definitely like season extension or season modification is, I've definitely seen it being a huge return on investment. Things like shade cloth, the germination netting, the germination cloth, frost protection, those sort of things. There's a lot of bells and whistles and a lot of things that claim to save you time, save you money, make things easier. And I would say by far from the limited experience that I have, that yeah, it's like season extension and season modification is definitely worth the, worth the investment so much so that it's like, maybe I've even considered taking the existing infrastructure, like our hoops and even just doing some like low cat, single bed, double bed, just to eke out a little bit of extra protection as opposed to I can get another roll of fabric and some more hoops for a fraction of what it would cost me to buy a new hundred foot yeah. caterpillar tunnel. And, but whatever it is, I definitely agree with you that season extension is the, is probably the biggest priority of investing in the farm. It's better to, and maybe better is not the right word, to focus on increasing profits 
early on in a business or increasing sustainable systems and perfecting your craft? I, I don't want to imply that they're mutually exclusive, but I could focus on doing things that like putting up tunnels that don't increase profitability, but it helps me longer term. Or I could focus on, let's just say selling at the expense of really learning how to grow. I'm bringing in more sales, but I'm not necessarily growing better. You only have so much time. You only have so much bandwidth. There's capital limits. And again, I know they're not mutually exclusive, but if you think about businesses and farm business early on, do you focus on getting better, putting systems in place? We'll assume this includes like covering costs as a basic. We're not just going into perpetual debt here. Or do you focus on profits? Like it, the first year you just make money and then perfect stuff later. I'm, my experience would be, and advice would be to think about cash is the lifeblood of every business as the very hackneyed saying goes, but it's so true. I would focus on selling. That's partly one of the reasons we bought transplants, what we call transplants sin to grow on because they get to market quicker. I can go back and learn how to grow it from the seed to the transplant stage when I've got a bit more time. But if I haven't got customers buying things from me, wherever they come from, whatever it is, I haven't got a business. And so for me, the most important thing is finding customers, finding what it is they want to buy, finding if they want to buy from you and giving it to them and building that relationship, building that trust. So the um, best thing you, sorry, I just, I just, I just, in a sense, just you're pulling a rope from the front, you're pulling that through and everything else will pull through behind. Cause if you grow it, if you're selling to customers, now I've got to grow something or buy something to sell to them. And now, I've, and now I've, I need somewhere to store that stuff. And now I need somewhere to pack that stuff. And, and so you'll build the business up behind it. Just reminds me of that. So was it Zappos, that famous story who the shoe brand, they just put a a picture of a shoe on a website, didn't have any manufacturing capability at all. Got a sale, they thought, what the hell do we do now? They found out what to do. And eventually they built back through their business right to, to, to the manufacturing side. Is it a very, probably a very apocryphal story, but that's the lean startup method. Start with doing something with your customer, get the feedback. Did they like that? Did they buy that? Did they come back for it? What was, did they enjoy consuming the product? And then the next thing is, if my customer likes that, and they like me selling it to them, but I can make that myself then. Oh. So we are making it ourselves. Theoretically, you don't even have to do that. It's, it's fine. Get your customers first. So that's where I'll start, Diego. Yeah, yeah. And sorry, yeah, yeah, I got it in there. But that's what I was echoing is the customer base is the most valuable thing you have early on. Get it as big as possible. Because I could see even a startup farm. If you can't produce everything, you could buy it from another farm. And yeah, that... Maybe a farmer's market or something might not let you, but you hit the nail on the head. I think they're Robert. If they want, if they trust you, they want to buy from you, you can provide it, then you can grow it later. And we've talked to Chaz and other people about eventually, like they can't make all their own stuff. So it has to get made to factory, but they're buying with your name, your branding, your recipe, that type of thing. So it's, yeah, it's expand that customer base as much as you can. Because I guess it, you, the trap is you fall in love with other things, right? I need to get this like soil so amazing. And you spend forever falling into the soil trap or perfecting you know, tomato grafting or something like that, which is important, but it's yeah. nowhere near as important, right? Yeah. yeah you've hit now on the there. there. And, and like, I think you've been living this anyway, haven't you? Did you say in one of the last recent podcasts that you bought some produce in from your your employer to, to, to install just one or two products. Yes. That's yeah. a great, that's a great, that's a great way. One, it fills your stall up and means that people come to you because you've got a good selection Two, If they like that, if they buy that stuff from you, maybe you can grow it next year. There's nothing to lose, is there? Sorry. Yeah. We, we were able to, to do that, to pad, pad our numbers, so to speak for a large event. Unfortunately, it was a kind of a one and done thing. I went back the next week and it was like, oh yeah. And they're like, yeah, man, we can't really, it just happened to land on. I was desperate enough that I guess they were willing to sell to me and they happen to have a, a little bit of a glut in uh, those particular things. But 
but it showed me that there are certain items that I didn't, I wasn't selling at the moment. And I was like, oh, these actually can be profitable at the particular price that I have to sell them at to turn a profit. For instance, peppers, like bell peppers, I wouldn't have sold them at $5 a pound. Um, but I knew if I didn't sell them at $5 a pound, I'm it, because I had to pay for them and I still need to recoup that cost and take a little bit off the top of that. I have to charge that. And now the peppers that I'm growing and selling, I'm selling them for six six dollars a pound. And so even if it was just for the experience of, okay, let's see how the market likes it. Are they willing to pay this price? Are they coming back and wanting it? All right. So now it, it's a good, not only does it give us a little bit of cash flow, but it's also, it's like, it's market research so that we're able to pivot and maybe adjust prices or adjust the selection. Like I'm not growing those peppers that I sold because they're a really striking purple Islander pepper, but man, people seem to love them. So I, I need to consider that next year. And I would have never had that if it wasn't like, I just have to have something on this table to sell for something. And it's like, we've talked about previously, Diego, of just that, that minimally viable product, just get something that you can sell, or at least tell someone that you're trying to sell. I even think about that with restaurants. I've heard so many different farmers and people say, don't show, don't come to a chef empty handed. You need to bring them like a full case of something so they can really work with it. And they can, they can put it through its paces on their line and blah, 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 blah. And it was, and my first meeting with like my first big restaurant account, uh, I was like, man, I don't, I can't do that. But it's, I could bring two bunches of turnips, a bag of arugula and two tomatoes. That's just all I had at the moment. And it was like, but this is a minimally viable, like this is actually something that I grew that I can present to them. And they ended up being blown away by the quality of what I had. Where would they have been blown away if I would have brought an eight pound case of fresh arugula? Probably, but realize, oh no, they just needed something like the minimally viable thing that they can realize, oh, this is what the potential is. And instead of it, me just trying to sell a bill of goods or sell the hype of the potential, I could do that. And there's been many times we've been at the farmer's market, we've done that and it's, I have next to nothing, but I, and my time may be spent better taking a day off or just working on the farm and supposed to go into market, but it's, we just got to keep going, keep showing our customers that we have stuff. And even if it's the first harvest of this, we're going to bring the two pounds of okra and just see if we can sell it instead of waiting for it to be the best version of itself that it can be and then present it. I think so many times we get caught up and we don't want to unveil something until it's perfect as opposed to just getting out there. I think I'm a big space nerd. And so the two up and coming companies are Blue Origin and SpaceX, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. One company is doing everything in secret behind closed doors to inevitably unveil a rocket that will change the world while another company is doing it all out completely in the open live streaming and everything and showing all of their epic failures along the way. And at least personally in my business, I feel like that's a much more sustainable, honest and lesson learning way of doing it is instead of just like taking these steadily easy steps of trying to reach perfection, it's just, let's just be messy. Let's be it's seemingly chaotic at times, but we're just getting product to market. We're getting it in front of customers. We're generating some semblance of cash flow, and then we can learn from those things and then take that cash flow and hopefully reinvest it in. And then one day, maybe perfection will be reached, or maybe it'll just be messy and chaotic from till the end of time. Either way, we're still going to keep cranking it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think perfection being the enemy of good. I think, I think you, one of you said that in the past as well. And that, that's so true, isn't it? And going back to your experience with the restaurants, had you not turned up at all because you didn't have the perfect thing, then they weren't going to be blown away. They had no chance of being blown away. At least if you turn up with two turnips and a, a, few, a handful of onions, there's a chance that they'll be blown away. And the fact that you've done so and been honest about where you are on your journey, uh, this is all we've got, but it's bloody good, isn't it? They're much more likely to, but immediately they're going to empathize with you and tr build trust and rapport with you and want to support you yeah. for all the right reasons. You're not doing that as a kind of, to be sneaky. You're just being you up front. This is, I'm standing here in front of you. I'm not perfect. This is where I am my journey. This is what I produce. Whatever I bring you, it'll be the best I can do. Uh, and that honesty 
other small business owners will really, it'll really resonate with them and it'll be very successful. But I know I'm blanking on the crystal organic. They might not always have stuff to sell you on a week to week basis or want to. What are your thoughts on bolstering your production from other farms that met your values to round out the offering more? If you didn't have that much, you're the one standing there making that connection with people week to week. And it can be like, here's the stuff we've grown. All of the things Rob said, we tried to make this the best we can to help give you guys more. I went out and I found farms that I work with and they had surplus and here it is. When that idea comes up, what is that? How does that land as a farmer? I think there's a lot of merit to it, especially if you can bring in something that sort of fills a niche that's not being met. I think if you're just grabbing product to fill out a table, regardless of, regardless of what it is, just because something's better than nothing, maybe if you're that desperate, maybe it'll work. But, but I would say filling a niche that someone else's product could fill can be a, a big winner. And I'm actually, I just finished a round of doing that right now. I was another guy who works at Crystal Organic with me, who's also getting his farm started. He's more wanting to focus on uh, or like garlic production. It's, you know, it's called ambling farm. So he's much more like slow and steady, or I'm just Mr. Chaos over here. And, but he, he was able to produce like a beautiful garlic harvest and made these beautiful braids. And I said, come on, man, like, I want you to come to market with me one week and I want you to sell it. And I want you to dig your toes in and it sold really well. And I was like, you know what? All of this extra product that you brought that we didn't sell, just keep it with me. Let me, I'll just sell it and I'll give you 75% of whatever I sell. And it's turned it into this thing. And I, I'm charging a premium where he was saying that garlic is selling for 80 cents an ounce. If you're you know, buying it, whatever, that's the going market price. And I'm charging, I think it comes out to somewhere in the neighborhoods of almost $2 an ounce. Like I, it's way above kind of market value, but it's become this little impulse buy where people will just go and buy a small head of garlic for a buck and it rounds out my thing. And then people are like, oh, you don't have any garlic this week. And, and because there's not like fresh garlic is not really one of those things that a lot of people have. I do green garlic or kind of spring garlic, but not like actual just fully headed out cured garlic. And so it was one of those things where I was able to find a particular niche that was not being met by the other producers in our market. And when now we're talking about just keeping that going perpetually, it doesn't really, doesn't really cost me anything, but shelf stable. I don't have to worry about, about, am I, is it going to spoil this week? I, I don't have to make a huge profit on it and I'm supporting a friend as well. And so I, I would say definitely open-minded to doing that if it can fill a niche and especially if it's shelf stable like i'm probably not going to be buying baby greens every week and then hoping that i can sell and if i don't it's all damn how am i going to get rid of this but if it's like sweet potatoes or winter squash or whatever and you can just sit on it then yeah i would say if it's filling a need that's not met and it's not gonna it's not gonna become another job then then it can think it'd be a great opportunity to pad your numbers fill out a table and maybe reach customers who initially wouldn't come to your booth, but they see something that's like a little different and a little striking. And it's, oh, you're the only one that has red curry squash. And then, and they buy red curry a couple of weeks in a row. And then they're like, yeah, let me get a bag of arugula. And then we're like, oh, now we're into real money-making territory because that's pure profit, more or less. I don't have to pay somebody else. And it's a much higher profit margin prop. And so... I think it can be a good sales tool overall. And yeah, and I think, I think just, just a quick but time check. You still okay? Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For anybody listening yeah, to fun. this, it's like midnight for Rob. So uh, kudos to him for doing this late night recording. All right. I'll let you run with that. I was just going to uh, make the, the, reiterate your point out a little. We'll play it back. That it's like that intentionality. So if you're going to take somebody else's products, you're really intentional about it, what you're why you're doing it, what you expect to get out of it, how long it's going to go for. You know, maybe there's a relationship there that you're building as well. That's associated with bi-directional. And so there's not just going along to wholesalers and sweeping loads of stuff into a trolley and going, down. that's not going to work. That's not your, that's the, because it's not, that's not what you're about. If you're a small business person, so you do everything for a good reason 
And if you've got that reason, then you'll believe in what you're selling and it'll, and it'll and it will sell as part of your overall value proposition. We have something similar, a similar relationship. There's a, a small business called Yorkshire Mushroom Emporium and they grow oyster, shiitake and now lines main mushrooms in an indoor environment again. And we've been working with them now for about at least six months. We they grow in straw bags and we take their waste straw and we put that on our land because it just adds organic matter into the land. So we've been doing that for a long time. And then we said, in return for you giving us it, we have to collect it. It saves them six hours a week processing, sorting out their waste. We come and collect it for them. So that works well. And I said, why don't we try selling some of your mushrooms at the farmer's market? So we take some, we tell, we sometimes will buy some at kind of trade price and some will take on the sale or return. If they've got some extra, we'll say, we don't think we can sell that, but we'll take it on sale or return. And normally they say, well, if you don't sell it, just eat it. Because it's only got a limit. That, that, that isn't shelf stable. Um, but actually we can turn some of, some of it into mushroom jerky. So we're having a play, play with that as an added, added, added products. But yeah, just those one or two relationships where we're bringing other people's produce to the markets and being very transparent with the markets, you know, the owners over that as well and why we're doing it. And that is a mutually beneficial relationship in it. But it certainly adds to our overall value proposition as having something that stands out a little bit different from the urinal selling fruit and veg in the market. How has selling ornamental plants worked for you? It sounds like it's been a nice diversifier. I could see farms doing that if it fit their context, if you have the space, both you're in your schedule and in your property or greenhouse. What is the the margin on that stuff and is there enough volume to justify it yeah i guess one other add-on too sorry what else works well is there i know you're in leeds uk different market but is there one like superstar out of that whole bunch out of the non-edible produce yeah or just generally i guess late spring early summer bedding plants and just single perennials are those shrubs is that or lavender or something like that it's so Small bamboo, clumps of bamboo, just in kind of eight inch pots like that. But more, mainly what it's, it's, it's just perennial, summer perennial plants, summer flowering perennial plants for people to put in their borders. And a lot of people come to the market. They, some people come to buy their fruit and veg, but the market's very mixed. Um, it is mostly food. But a lot of it is uh, artisan cheeses or cakes and stuff. And people aren't necessarily in the mind to be buying potatoes and stuff, but they want to buy something nice to take home. That's a nice piece of cake or a nice cookie or a nice coffee or some honey or some local eggs. And so a plant then is something that could easily fit into their bag. We, and attracts a conversation. It's a good conversation. People want to know, tell me about this plant. What does it like? Shade, part sun, full sun, how often does it need to be water, does it need to be fed, is it cat friendly? So there's a good conversation, you're building that relationship. And I'd say there's a very good crossover between people that buy our fruit and veg and people that buy our plants, like a Venn diagram with a, with a substantial overlap. So it's just um, another thing, like Alex said, of it's something different, it catches somebody's eye, it gives them a conversation piece, then they start talking, they well, what else you got around here? And they look around. Yeah. When they could have easily yeah. just walked by. Yeah, I like they that. could, but it is, it's not there just to be that kind of butterfly. It is valuable in its own right. It right. Would, I would say it is that those plants are some of the most profitable in terms mm. of gross margin, the most profitable things we grow. And as I said before, the great thing is you don't, they don't sell. You don't have to be easing it for the next week. Great. Just, are, to, are just you, to use it up yourself. <laughs> are you propagating these like from cuttings or dividing things from things that you're growing at the farm or are these like, are you starting things from seed or are you buying in rootstock? I ha like, how are you? A, a real mix, yeah. a real mix. And we will keep that mix. But I'd say over the three years, we've drifted more towards buying plug plants in and growing them on because being, getting, getting the germination, the germination is an art form in itself and we are not experts in Germany. We don't have a germination chamber yet. That would be something that's another important thing. But you think I can spend all this time learning how to germinate, but I can buy these things in for a few pennies each. I don't have to mm. trick them out. I don't have to, with tiny seeds, you've got to sow them on a tray, 
get them oh, to yeah. germinate. Then you've got to prick them all out into the next size pot, then the next size pot. So you've probably spent maybe 20 minutes per plant by the time it's got to a seedling that's going to go into its final pot. And that, that is, it's actually cheaper just in, if you type, but it costs your time out just to go and buy that as a block plant half the time and less risky because all those from seed to the, po the point where it goes into its final pot, it can fail at any stage for any reason. You can get eaten, you can get frosted on, you can forget to water it. Um, this way, um, you're just picking it up a really healthy, well-produced plug plant that you can grow on. So, uh, so good mix. Yeah. A good mix. We do it. We don't, yeah. we, I think you've got to enjoy what you're doing. We do enjoy, I still get such a buzz you know, just growing microgreens and pea shoots. You, you know, you can see this thing start to sprout. You see this pea, this little leg start to come out of the pea. And it's a miracle every time, isn't it? Every time you see it. So I'm never going to, I'm never going to not grow things from seed, but for volume, you've got to be either paying other people on your farm or paying other people by buying it in from somebody else. Actually, you're still paying that someone to do it, aren't you? But it's so much more convenient to pay somebody else in somebody else's business to do it. But you'd have to employ them and handle all their insurances and everything else that goes on. You see, it's just effectively subcontracting that germination to seedling process out, I see as you could employ someone still, or you just buy it in. It's, there's really no difference. I think in this space, or at least this is the way I feel, is that there's this, I wouldn't call it a lie, but there's this temptation that you have to control everything from seed to harvest to distribution to, it's like the, the ideal world and I'm doing this. Yeah. It's like you buy seed, you buy mix, you take care of it from the moment that seed gets planted to the moment that you give it to the end consumer is going to take it home and do it. That's exactly yeah. what we're, that's exactly how we felt in our first year yeah. and we've moved with one of our huge learnings is to not feel. That is the only way to run the, that, that defines an honest business and any deviation from that means you're not an honest business. That is not the case. We work in a very interconnected world. Nobody makes their own electricity. Nobody yeah. supplies their own mains water. Nobody builds their own van. So as long as you, as long as you're true to, to your ethics and you know where you stand, then I don't feel there's anything wrong. We work, we you know, we work with partners and, and. Businesses are not standalone, isolated islands. They're ecosystems. You don't, you can grow your own seed. Yeah. We'd love to do our own seed. Maybe you buy a seed in. You can grow your own seed. Now you've got to do all your own fertilizers. You're going to build your own hoops. Where'd you stop? Yeah. And I think you, at least, yeah, I think, and that's done in a lot of ways. It's to maximize profit because if you can buy everything and in its most simplest form, a packet of seed is going to be far less expensive than a tray of plugs. But when, yes, maybe you were max maximizing the profit gain that you could potentially have on that product, not taking into consideration the risk, the upfront investment, so many different variables. And, and I think an unfair advantage that we have that doesn't get talked about, and we talked about it a good bit today is the advantage of just being at market, whether you're selling an ornamental plant or someone else's garlic braids or microgreens or a hat and with your brand on it, that it's like just the advantage of being at a booth where people come every single week and they recognize you and you build a rapport with them, that it's like that in itself can be a good enough reason to bring in another product or bring in another variety of something. That was the whole reason with the garlic was it was like he had all this garlic and had no way to sell it. And it's like, listen, man, like I've already done the heavy lifting of getting into this market. Let's just bring it and sell it. And I think that was the moment when I realized how beneficial uh, and how much of an advantage it was to be in front of eyeballs, be in front of people walking by and having that perpetually warm lead of people coming every single week um, to the point where, yeah, we, we, we've contemplated and we're potentially planning on doing some value added stuff with like pickles, doing merch, talk about propagating some of our fruit trees, our figs and our pears to start selling those at potted plants next year, bringing in from other farms. And I think, yeah, when you begin to begin to realize how much of an advantage your market is and your place in that market, it really opens up the potential revenue opportunities where maybe it's a small profit margin product, but if it doesn't require much more work, like the garlic, 
I made $25 selling a hundred, hundred dollars worth of garlic. And it was no sweat off my brow. He brought it to me. He told me what it was. I just set it there. People buy it. And I just give him cash and I made 25 bucks. And maybe it's, and there's just a myriad of benefits just from having the advantage of being at that market. Yeah. Back to what we said, we're talking about earlier about the, the focusing on the customer, getting the customer to trust you and to buy things from you is, and, ev and you, everything else will pull through from there. But just reflecting back on what we were saying about uh, sort of this feeling that you have to get the seeds and then manage every stage and sell it to, to, to the customer. I think that's a good thing to do in the first year because you learn every stage, don't you? And then, then yeah. when you, then, then you can make decisions about over time, you make decisions about where is your strength, where is your core competence and where are your interests, where's your passion. And you may turn out that you are, you love that showman. You might be an introvert, but you love that showmanship of being on the market store. And you could sell customers tin cans, rusty tin cans, anything. Yeah. Because you just, and that's what you love. And okay, then you, just, you subcontract the rest out to somebody else. You're giving somebody else work. You're not denying anybody anything here by working in an ecosystem rather than having it in all in one legal entity. There's no, it's just vainglory to say that ultimately, isn't it? I think we know that in our hearts. We all stand on the shoulders of others and we all cooperate with others in order to, to, to live our lives in whatever we do. So yeah, I think do, do try and do as much as you can in the first year to learn that business and then work out what your strengths and competencies and interests are and slowly back off to other people who are better at that bit of the business than you are. Why would you waste? You're not going to deliver such a good product to your customer. If you're investing an inordinate amount of time on something you're not very good at, and somebody is very good at that and can do it at the same price or cheaper when you've lost your time in, let them do it. They're the better person to do it. You'll deliver a better product to your customer as a result of making in that decision. That's, I'm totally with you guys. And that comes down to what's your goal as a business to deliver the most value you can to your customer which means the best possible product for what they're paying or to do everything yourself at the expense of value. And they're again, not mutually exclusive, but you're right. Your customer trusts you to provide the best possible lettuce. You don't, you want to tell an accurate story. You don't want to be dishonest, but I'm with you, Rob. If you can't grow a good plug, then you're not going to have a good lettuce crop Buy the plug or whatever. However, it comes down, you hire somebody in to harvest it. That's a slightly different example, but just because you didn't harvest it, does it mean you didn't grow it? You know, yeah. you can forever go on nuance, but I think that point you brought about is really good. I think there is a lot of pressure for these small farms to, to literally do it all, to check every single box for their own values, for the values they think their customers want, for the values they think their Instagram followers want and at some point, it's just too damn much to keep up with and you can't do it all. And it's not scalable, is it? Because ultimately it's not scalable because there's only one of me and one yeah. of Sarah. We can't clone ourselves. So we don't, at some point you run out of time. And you have core competencies. We all do, yeah. right? It's yeah. what, I think that's a big part you'd say of success is at this point in your career, if you look at what you're doing on the farm, and this is going to Alec. Do you have an idea of, of everything done in the farm business from marketing to accounting, to sales, to cultivation, to propagation, where, what are your, your areas of excellence? If you had to look at everything on the farm, what are the three or four categories where you're like this, if, if I had a team of 10, these are the areas I own, manage, lead, and the other stuff can go down the line. Definitely everything on the sales side, the forward facing side of the business. Yeah. I feel if you gave me the challenge to sell ice to an Eskimo, I could, I'd give it a pretty damn good try. And then I would say on the other end of that is like the big picture of the mission and the heart behind what we're doing. And then what is the direction and like crop selection? I feel like I, I have a pretty good idea of what people want. Of, and maybe it's because it is from the side forward facing perspective, but yeah, any, anything that is customer focused, customer based is definitely one of my strong suits. And then the more nuanced, the more administrative a task gets, I'd say the least, the less capable I am. It, some people are just natural born 
bookkeepers or just note takers or whatever. And they might thrive in the prop house, keeping track of seedlings and keeping track of planting schedules and things like that. And, and it's just not, <laughs> it's definitely not my strong suit. A natural born bookkeeper. That's a scary thought, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We talked a couple of weeks ago about a new business idea that might birth out of that, but uh, yeah. you'll have to hear that in a couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. One other thing, going back to something you said at the beginning, and, and I'm no way implying this or knock on wood, wanting this for you, Alec, but Rob, you talked about the 135 schedule. There are a lot of business, not just farm businesses, that they don't work. And I'm not talking about an obvious failure. I tried to do this, and right away, I know it's, it's just mistakes were made. It doesn't work. But do you think there's a line between you need to do a business for so long before you pull the plug? Or in other words, I could quit it. Again, it's not obvious. So six months, it's you really didn't learn anything. You didn't give a chance to get the market going. So we can't really stop after six months. But you don't want to drag that six-month mediocre thing along behind you for five years. Is there a line of... That's probably long enough to make a good judgment. I would say, I'd say if you're going to, at least in this context, if you're going to try and farm, give it a year. Don't quit until you've gone through a full season because you have no idea. I I thought going into this summer, it's going to be hot, but it's going to be great. We're just going to be bursting with abundance. People left and right wanting to just buy everything that we have. It's going to be like the peak of our season. And part of that was just, most of it was just ignorance of not asking enough questions of the people around me, realizing that it's like August is probably one of, if not the slowest month of the year around here. And so even with that, like if I was going based upon what my expectations versus what my reality is, that this summer would have been a great time to quit because it's, man, if this is the best time and this is as bad as we're doing, then it's, it's not going to get any better. But in all reality, I'm realizing it's like, oh no. There are the, these kind of shoulder seasons where things can really excel here and where a, a farm like me can really stand out with a lot of the kind of specialty, high profitable things that we're doing. And then if you can really dial in winter growing and then really stand out when everyone else takes a break. And those are lessons that I am learning and would not have learned if I didn't at least stick it out a full year. And so I would say, it, it, yeah, definitely at least give it a year and really, yeah, look at the full season. And I wouldn't even say like you sign a lease in September and you go till September. I'm saying you sign a lease and you start working on a property whenever you do that. But from the moment that you actually start growing for your harvesting and selling product and planting for that goal in mind, from the beginning of that all the way through 12 months later to that. And then that'll be so... Yeah, come March, yeah, the beginning of spring will be our big time. Like, all right, we've done a full year. Let's really contemplate that. And then I, yeah, and then I could see how, and then if you can, if you're like, all right, we did it a year, it's good. And then, yeah, I think naturally uh, another three, another two more years and get to that three year time. I mean, it's, it really does seem like that kind of one, three, five, and then maybe 10 feels like if you've reached the goal of, or you've surpassed the achievement of getting to this phase, then it's, you might as well stick it out until whatever. Because if, if you get to the end of year one and you're miserable and you're broke and you don't even really know if you do it, what is two more years going to do? You're not going to magically find your groove and it's going to fix everything. And so, yeah, I, w- I would really encourage to at least stick it out for a full season. And then from there, yeah, probably a couple more seasons to before you make a decision. Because I think the one thing that everyone wants to, is afraid of is did I miss the window where things could get better or it's, I should have broke up with that girl a long time ago and I waited until it got really bad. And I think that's what everyone's fear is. And if you're already have, and if you're already having the thoughts of, I don't know if I really want this to work out, you've probably already made your decision. Yeah, I, 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 I absolutely agree with what you've said there. I think going through everything once, if when you've gone through everything once, if you give up at any point in that first 12 months or at the end of that 12 months, basically you've decided that this isn't for you. Either you don't want it or it can never work. 
the years two and three are when you apply, start applying the learnings of what you learned in year one. The year one, you've done it for the first time. Now you have the chance to make it better and improve on it in years two and three, don't you? So they're, they're the kind of the real key years for me. So yeah, year one, you just didn't want it. It wasn't right for you. Year three, I've, I've been through the cycle. I've tried to apply the learnings and I can't make it pay or I've lost interest or something's happened you know, externally that means this isn't viable anymore. And then, then at year five, okay, it's like a different decision. Do I really want to do this now as a long-term substantial part of my career? Or has it been a, a really great five years, but I want to move on to try another adventure. So I think that's, for me, they are, you know, it may not be one, three, five for exactly for everybody, but they kind of feels about right for making those kind of decisions. Here's one for I you, mean, Rob. Uh, oh, go ahead. There, there's a cadence to a business. And in the beginning, it can be rolling and you're like a rocket ship. Yes, here we go. And it's up and you're loving it. It's exciting. And Italy, you're going to crest. And then you dip down and you get in that dip period. What are your thoughts on riding out a dip, determining if a dip is actually a dip before the next launch? or determining whether the dip is phase is over, you was short-lived, the market's changed, something's moved on you, and the dip is actually just a flat spot before the downcline, decline. Do you have any yeah. thoughts on that further from farming or from other businesses? Yeah, sure. I think the first thing to do when you get in that is to give yourself a little bit of distance between you and the business. And to look at, try and take a more of an external perspective on it rather than, I think if you take a very internal perspective, you can start blaming yourself and making it about you rather than about what's happening some, somewhere in the environment. It could be climate change, could be a soil, could be some pestilence that swept through, it could be a change in your customers for some reason, it could be product quality. It could be the way you're doing your marketing, but they're all things that you can take some time to reflect on. So certainly you have to, I would say a minimum of half a season, you know, ideally, I mean, if camera always got the luxury of 12 months, have you, but let's uh, say minimum of six months to make sure that, that you've had time to reflect on why this dip is happening. And is it, what is it in there that you can control and what can't you control? If you can control it, then go and control it. We're in business because we believe that we can control what we can control. There are certain things we can't control. And I think you have to be aware of those and try and identify those because there's no point in keeping going with a business where something outside your control means that business can never offer you a sustainable income or sustainable satisfaction. I like it. I think that that makes a lot of sense in, in ways. Uh, it's a topic that's came up a lot because people have emailed mm -hmm. me about that. We've definitely been through them and meaning me, I've been through them over the last few years of things are going and then it quiets down maybe due to macro factors and you're like, oh, what's going on here? Uh, feel good. And it brings up the fear because you can go from this emotional roller coaster of the business is great. You're not thinking about the longevity of the business to, holy shit, I think about the longevity of the business 24 seven. And yeah, yeah, it's like, how long do you want that to ride out? And that, and somebody once told me this, and it's true, this is woo, woo, there's obviously no science in this, but it, it always feels the worst before it turns or things always tend to turn. And I had more or less seen that. That's not say hope and pray and it's all good. Keep spending like a wild man. You triage and, and cut back. But things generally come around if there's a pattern of success. This is not for somebody three months in, but three, four, six, seven years in, it's wow, okay, we're slow. Eventually it just picks up, but those dips can be immensely stressful. Where the business, is, even if it's just sustainment, I've been there where it's, we're just going sideways. We're not growing and it's, I, I don't know that I like this. And it's that human emotion of, I'd rather win a dollar or I'd rather lose 
it feels worse to lose a dollar than it does to win ten dollars type thing. It's I'm going sideways, I'm not going backwards. But man, it feels like I'm getting killed. Done business before that it isn't all growth, that it is a is a roller coaster. Life's a roller coaster, isn't it? Yeah. Shit happens in our lives. But we carry on. We don't give up. We carry on. And the business is has got that personality as well. We embody that business so we carry on as well. But I think that it's important to have that network. And I think for me, as I said at the beginning of this podcast, listening to you, Alec, and your journey, your ups and downs, even though I've got probably got a lot more overall business experience than you because I've been on this planet a lot longer, I still find that really helpful to me to get give me that perspective. And though tough times will come, that is normal. That is not abnormal to have a tough time. It's not abnormal to have a appalling farmer's market where you take loads of stuff home and have to give it away or bin it or eat the same, eat cucumbers nonstop 24 seven for a week to get rid of them all. That's life. That is yeah. life. It's going to, it's going to happen. And it's how you deal with it. Oh, that defines your, <laughs> it's going to parody the, uh, the old sayings, but it's, I think that's really true, isn't it? So accept that will happen. Just be that little bit distant from it. Observe it. Don't let it eat you up. Learn from it. Observe it. L ride it and have faith that you'll come out the other end. Because as you said, the darkest point of the night is just before dawn. And I think too, that's why having the, we talked about give it a full season, whatever these markers are, if you can tell yourself, even you guys have much more experience with dips and lulls than, than I have, but if you can tell yourself, if I can, let's at least ride this out until March, just see. And if the dip keeps dipping, then maybe it's time to dip. But, but I, I, my kids teach me so much. I, I witnessed it in my daughter on Saturday. She decided that she wanted to pick, um, a bunch of the flowers from her flower, flower garden. And she wanted to make bouquets and sell them at the market all of her own accord. And so we helped her harvest them and make these little bouquets and we set them up at the market. Super proud moment. And almost instantly, I think she sold four little bouquets right off the bat. She was beaming. And then two ladies walk by and she and her cute little mousy four-year-old voice, Hey, would you like flowers or however she said it? And they're like, Oh no, thank you. And they walked away and I watched her, she hung her head and she said to herself, nobody wants to buy my flowers. And me as her dad with a much bigger perspective, I saw, no, babe, it's two people. You just sold four and you had, you had your first little moment of rejection. But then in that moment, I stepped back and realized, oh my God, that is me. Every slow farmer's market. It could have been the greatest week before that. And I go, we're going to fail. We're done. And, and then, so for me, it was just that realization that's, oh no, sometimes you, I have to have this bigger, longer term perspective of see like, all right, this is one week, this is one month in a year, in a three year, in a five year cycle. And if I can just be willing to tough it out until this predetermined thing that it feels like a goal that's been set or a, a lap around the track or whatever it is that, yeah, like you said, Diego, oftentimes things tend to work out. It's definitely a journey. And I think the hard part, and I guess the great part is just hearing the reality of what other people go through, because you automatically assume when you're not doing good, that everybody around you is doing good. So in yeah. conversations or you watch somebody on Instagram or something like that, and you're like, man, why am I the only farm that can't do anything? Or why is my business suck right now? And here I am talking to all these people. But that's just, that's you making up this story that's usually not even true because they usually have all sorts of stains and problems going on in their lives, in their business. You just can't see them. But we fall into this trap of telling ourselves that it's just me and it's never just you. This is the journey of it all. And I, I think there probably is some serious or real when you know it's over, it probably feels like it's over. If you've been there in a relationship, you just know it's, this is it. I can't do anymore. Where there's times when you get in a fight and you're like, oh my God, like I can't do this. And it, you just blow off some steam. 
and it's not over. But I think we've all been there with every experience in our lives, at a job, in a relationship, whatever, where you know, and I think a business is the same. And it goes back to a lot of things you've said, Rob. You've given it time. You've tried things. You've analyzed your results. You've looked at things. You've stepped back and you're just, you don't know what to do. It's beyond you. You don't want to fix it, all these things. And, then, and that's when you move on. Yeah. I think ultimately in your heart when it's over. And then you have to have the courage to actually do something about, take that step and, and do something else. But I was going to reflect a little bit earlier. I think you did a really smart thing, Alec, with, the, with having the position at Crystal Organic as well. And I don't know how flexible that is. I've been in positions where, where it's something that like starts off as a side hustle, it can grow. But it can be flexible and then it can, can flex up and down and, and the other employment can flex up and down to, so you're always bringing in the, the base level of money you need in. And that's a really smart move to make. And I'd encourage you not to, one, one thing I would encourage you not to do is not throw, the, not throw that away. Try and keep that as long as, longer than you think you're going to need it. I know maybe after um, 12 months, I'm jacking it in at Crystal Organics and I'm going full time in this. Just double that. Just leave that door, at least leave that door open. Because you never know when that, that bad quarter is going to come through and it can make a difference in your business surviving for 10 years and folding after 18 months. Get out of my head, Rob. Ah. Stop, stop knowing all of my thoughts. Yeah, that's, yeah, the temptation of we had the best week this week that we've had in three months and when it's all, oh, man, yeah, let's pull the trigger. Let's, let's cut our losses and let's just make it happen. But at the same time, it's, I think I've told myself for better or for worse, unless some extenuating circumstance comes and changes, let's give this a year, let's give it a year. And then let's make a decision on if we think that we can do this full time or not. But yeah, but you definitely, uh, you know, where my mind is at. Yeah. I'm sure other people would say, just go for it and jack everything in, but you've got responsibilities, man. Yeah. You've got family, you're not, it's not just you, you can't. Go and live in a cardboard box for six months. You have no money. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to, so you've got responsibilities. So you have to be more cautious. But I think that's, you know, I see that as a sign of maturity, not being an entrepreneur and a risk taker. You're taking plenty of uh, risks and showing great entrepreneurship. Having is what, as we've talked about products and services, everything we've talked about is about managing ri So much of running a business is about managing risk and, and having a back off, a backup income. Is managing the long-term sustainability, that risk of, of, of keeping your business sustainable in the long term. So I'd think very carefully about completely lifting go of it. To wrap, start to wrap this one up, uh, I'll use Alec as the example, but this is really addressed to any first-year farmer. And I'll have you answer this, Rob. What are things you think somebody can do after their first year to evaluate success, how things went and plan for the future. So you've been through year one. If you're sitting down talking to that farmer, what would be points you'd really want them to key in on to think about as they review the year that was and look towards the first year or the, not the first year, the following year? I think there's some obvious things. Where did I screw up? Style, where do we know I screwed up and I can fix it? If you know where you've screwed up, you've got that level of self-awareness, then you can fix it. I think the other thing is looking across your business. You can divide a business up, back office, front office, and within back office and front office, there's certain areas you can do. And you can start to say, how am I developing my competencies across all of those fronts? Where am I starting to maybe learn that I am going to be stronger in some than others? Where do I want to focus my energies across these you know, eight or 10 sections of my business in, in the next year uh, and reflect back on what you've, en what you've enjoyed, what you physically and mentally can do and cope with. But I would just always come back to that. The one most important thing is getting your customer base. I don't, I don't know, that would be my keystone for judging whether I had dictated my success over the first 12 months. To what extent have I built a customer base? Meaning you want to see, you'd want to see a robust repeat group of customers that show they are spending money consistently and it's providing this kernel that you can build a business upon with the ability to expand that customer base outward. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, they would say it costs six times more to acquire a new customer and sell something to an existing customer, don't they? You want to do both. You want to sell more to your existing customers and you want to increase your customer base. But you've got to have some customers to be in a position to worry about, do I sell more to their customers or do I get more customers? That's a nice problem to have. Let's get some customers, get them buying from you, get talking to them, get understanding them. It doesn't matter what you sell them. It'd be a bit facetious, but in some senses, it doesn't matter what you sell them. What you're doing is building that trust. And that's the key where you want to say, where after 12 months, how, where am I in that section of my business? That is the most important one. Everything else can follow that can, in a sense, you can pull that through. Without customers, you've got nothing. Yeah, I 100% agree. That's the roadmap to the future. And I don't want to beat that point anymore, but you're right. You can always fix quality later, but you can have the perfect product with no one to sell it to. And that's not a business. That's you're an artist or a hobbyist. To conclude this one, Alec, you have anything else you want to throw across Rob's bow here? No, I'd just say, just, yeah, thank you for one well, the encouragement. I think I come into these always expecting to be peppered with questions. And I think you just did more to just motivate me and encourage me. So thank you. I highly appreciate that. And yeah, and, and thank you for being transparent about your journey. I think so many times in these conversations, we end up talking about more universal entrepreneurial principles and we do farming specific things. And it sounds like you've had, you've dipped your toe into many a different waters when it comes to that. And so I'm grateful to be able to glean glean from your fields of wisdom. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. And if you ever find yourself in the land of the free and the home of the brave, you always have a place outside of Atlanta to stay. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. And, and the invite, the reciprocal invite goes out to you too. If you're ever, if you're ever in the UK or England, Yorkshire, Leeds. But yeah, love to see you. But I hope, I'd, I have no idea how long you two are going to keep this relationship up in the podcast, but I'm enjoying it. I'm inspired by it. I'm comforted by it. And I've enjoyed it so far. And I hope one way or the other, I'll continue to, to mark your journey and to watch your journey, which I'm sure is going to be really successful, Alec. And to you, Diego, thanks for all the work and you, the investment you've put into this community over the past, over 10 years now, isn't it? Through your podcasts, always insightful, always challenging, don't always agree with you, but that's great. That's fantastic. When I don't want to disagree with you, I probably learn more than when I agree with you. But always, always interesting and a joy to listen to. So thank you very much for what you've done for our community. Yeah, absolutely. And it's my pleasure. I, I enjoy these. I get a lot out of them personally. This one's been amazing to do. And, and I want to thank you for reaching out. I mean, this is the power of doing this. Initially, when I somebody pitched this, Chaz, I was like, okay, that's a one-off. I don't think other people would want to. And, and since then, I've gotten about... 10 or 12 people who've wanted to come on and join us. We never really know what to expect, or I don't, which is fine. I love having these conversations, just going in blind. But anybody else, if you're listening to this and you want to add to this conversation, because I think we all are part of this community and sharing these stories is how we build resiliency. And even though we're a continent apart and then an ocean apart, we can do this through the magic. You're doing this late at night. Uh, also, for people that want to follow your farm, where's the best place to check out Passion for Plants? Is it Instagram, website? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't touch on how appalling our social media marketing is. But yeah, passionforplants.co.uk at uh, web, Instagram, the channels occasionally on. 